I think we still have a few, few more people logging into the call, but I'm going to go ahead and get started with the housekeeping and introducing our speaker. Um, hopefully more people will join us as we get going today. Welcome everybody to TASA's October webinar series. Uh, we're happy to have you here with us today. Um, we know there's lots of stuff going on in the state, especially for social workers who also have some training calls and um, national social work stuff. So this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on TASA's YouTube page within seven to 10 business days, pending any technical difficulties um, that we might have with Zoom recording us. Um, if you need any assistance with webinars or want to know what's upcoming for the rest of the month, please contact me, Crystal Garcia at cgarcia at tasa.org, and I'm happy to help you um, get signed up for webinars. Uh, today we have Jessica Sanchez with us, and she does the Relationship Violence and Sexual Assault Prevention Programming and the LGBTQ plus programming at the University of Texas Arlington. Um, she's pursuing her doctoral work in human sexuality studies um, and hopes to complete that in August of 2021. Um, and she's also working on her certification with the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. I know Jessica is new to Texas, so we are happy to have her with us. And I'm looking forward to her workshop today on a sex positive framework that we can use with working with survivors of sexual assault. So I'm gonna turn it over to her and let her go ahead and get started. One thing I do wanna point out is we are going to be relying on the Q&A box today. Um, we're gonna hold all of the questions until the end um, because she's built in some time for us to work on questions together. So I'm gonna be monitoring the Q&A box. If you have any questions about content as we're going, please feel free to use the Q&A box. And then at the end of this webinar, when all the content is presented, we will be going through those questions together as a group. So you can still use the chat box. Um, all cameras and mics are gonna stay muted, um, but we're gonna rely heavily today on the Q&A um, feature to get all of our content questions answered. So, all right, Jessica, whenever you're ready, floor is yours. So. Thank you so much, Crystal. Hi, everyone, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, Crystal, I appreciate, you know, us connecting. And I think that's kind of like where I want to start, y'all. Like Crystal was saying, I am new to Texas. Um, I'm confident that I, I have got the y'all down in a pretty good, a good place now. Um, but with that, you know, coming on to UT Arlington and overseeing, you know, two very crucial programs um, on, on this campus that serve marginalized populations, right? I was telling Crystal um, before we got on the call that the morning just did not start as planned. I have a very big red flag campaign set up right outside my office for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And then I also have a pride campaign going on um, with the magnitude of you know, different pride flags and y'all means all is what we are doing this year at UT Arlington. And someone decided to vandalize a couple of our flags and um, it's, you know, kind of adding that on with what we're dealing with right now um, as a social worker with our, our state board um, and just our political climate. It just wasn't the way the morning, morning was gonna, you know, how I had it planned, but I'm again, happy to be here. And I, I kind of say that to also segue into that networking piece. So being new to Texas, um, my first time attending TASA was just this past summer. Um, and being that I identify as Latina, Mexican American, gonna go into that just a little bit deeper, but I'm attending TASA. I know that a lot of Latinas, I don't come across a lot of Latinas in the field who are even talking about sex or studying human sexuality. And then all of a sudden I see Crystal Garcia pop up on my screen as a, as a workshop option. And she literally knows about kink and BDSM. And y'all, when my heart was so full, I was like, I have to know her. Um, and so I say that to say, if this, you know, as we're going through this presentation, um, if we connect on identities or, you know, any, anything that sticks out to you that we have some type of shared common interest, I would love to network with you is what I'm saying, because there needs to be a lot of us doing this work, right? And um, in order to literally change the way how we serve victims and survivors of sexual assault. And so again, thank you so much for the opportunity and I'm glad to be here. And hopefully at the end, I'm connecting with more folks that are passionate about the work like I am. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen. And Crystal, can you just give me, I can see you verbal head nod that you can see my screen. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, y'all, so 
like the like the you know the headliner it says it's time right implementing a sex positive framework when working with sexual assault survivors um, I want to start first with some housekeeping. Anytime that we're talking about sex and sexuality, human sexuality, however we're labeling it, um, it's a sensitive topic. We're going to dive in deeper to, you know, how those beliefs may sit with us, how that impacts the way we even view sex positivity. Um, but with that, I just want us to all be, you know, uh, cognizant of that, that we're talking about a sensitive topic and it can create discomfort. I want you to, to lean into that discomfort today if you feel any point throughout this presentation. Ooh, Jessica, that's, that's a spot that I'm not ready to go there yet. That's fine. Put it in your parking lot and I want you to revisit it at another time. But lean into that with me today because that's the only way we're going to grow. Um, vulnerability, right, is always apparent. I'm sure folks, um, you know, are going to ask some great questions at the end or throughout, please drop those in the Q&A and Crystal's gonna keep track of those for me. Um, but I always appreciate vulnerability. I'm a very transparent person myself, so I have no problem sharing my experiences, um, but I also appreciate when other folks are matching that as well. Hey, y'all, we don't know what we don't know, right? Anytime I'm talking to folks about human sexuality and it's not necessarily their world, um, kind of what we experience a lot working with our sexual assault victims and survivors, that shame can very much be apparent in the same way that I'm, I'm having conversations with folks who literally just aren't familiar with sex, sexuality based on their own upbringing, the systems that they, um, you know, that they occupy, etc. So with that, folks may ask questions that may seem apparent to some, but literally every question is valid. Okay, I'm going to answer every question as if that person came with good intuition, good vulnerability, and simply wants to do better, so they asked it, okay? One mic rule, of course, Vegas rule, I statements, definitely talk from your own personal experience, no community, no racial, ethnic, you know, ethnicity is monolithic, so make sure we're talking from the I and the my experience, and then validation is always good, right? Of course, when, you know, even on the presenter side, um, but at the end, you know, affirming folks who are speaking out, affirming folks who are asking questions um, is always great. So that's my little housekeeping today. I want to dive in as well into language. Um, I want to recognize, just like Crystal said, I oversee the LGBTQ plus program at the university. I am a very passionate, uh, committed advocate and ally both for survivors and for the LGBTQ plus community. With that though, however, when I am talking in this presentation, um, sometimes I very much you know, resort back to the binary terms of he and she, uh, especially when we're talking about sexual assault or relationship violence of some sort. Um, so I just wanna put that out there now that is, there's no, it's not me being intentional. Um, it's just simply what, what may happen today. So I just wanted to acknowledge that in the beginning. Interaction wise, I may turn off my camera here in a little bit, um, just for my own little comfort level in the way I'm presenting today. And so I just wanted to allow other folks to do that as well. I know that you all are on your own, um, you know, laptops and I can't see you, but you can see me. And so I may disappear just quickly, but I just want to let you know that I am still here with you all the way through. All right, so a little bit more about me. Who am I? Who is this Jessica Sanchez that's sitting in front of you? Identities that I hold, y'all. First generation, Mexican-American, Chicana, Chingona, woman of color, right? Very passionate about the work that I do. Identify as a professional code switcher for folks in the room who are people of color, Black, Indigenous folks as well. Um, usually I get a, a lot of head nods when I'm in a room on what it means to code switch with the resiliency and the sur survivalship that we experience on the daily. Um, I love identifying as both an academic and a trap scholar. Um, I say that with, you know, I enjoy my Cardi, my Meg the Stallion, my Juvenile, um, you know, all sorts of music, but I can also absolutely uh, publish any type of research that I need to. I can dig deep into the book so I can balance both worlds. Again, that code switching piece. Survivor and LGBTQ plus ally is a definitely identities that I hold true to. Um, future doctora, like Crystal was saying, I am studying right now human sexuality for my doctorate. I hold an MSW and an MED in human sexuality. Um, I will re receive um, my degrees from Widener University. So that's where I received my MSW, my MED. I say that um, because Widener University is actually the number one institution for sex educators and sex therapists. Um, so it's just good for y'all to know that um, our curriculum is ASECT certified. So all the curriculum credit that I earned translates over into the ASECT realm. 
Um, and then therefore I'm paying for my supervision right now. So that kind of puts me ahead of the game instead of starting from you know, square one because of the curriculum that I've already earned, um, I have the ASEC um, credentials, approvals, approvals working towards my credentials. What I'm studying for my degree and uh, for my doctorate, I'm looking specifically at Mexican American women aged 18 to 24 years old and how they experience their sexual subjectivity. So how do they experience pleasure and desire? How do they contract for safety? Um, how do they communicate their, essentially their, their sexual needs and you know, when they're with their partners? And then how are they viewing their overall body image and agency? Um, I'm very, I love working with college age folks in that 18 to 24 age range, um, specifically because we get to rewrite so many scripts at such a young age, depending on what um, you know, capacity we're serving them in. Um, but I always explain to students, listen, from birth, the moment you were out the womb, all the way to that 17, 18 age range, um, more than likely you were um, told what to do by some type of guardian, parent, caregiver, et cetera. Um, you had very much those decisions were made for you, right? What you were going to wear based on your caregiver, parent, socioeconomic status, what you were going to eat, what sports you were possibly going to play, um, and you know what house you were living in, et cetera. And then all of a sudden you get to college, right? And let's say you do have the privilege of being able to live on campus. All of a sudden the autonomy and agency that you have is something that you've never experienced before, right? And so I, I hypothesize that I will see when I'm, you know, in conducting my interviews is that women will have um, higher sexual subjectivity. They will experience sexual sub subjectivity at higher rates versus um, peers who are possibly not enrolled or are not living on campus. Um, so that's kind of where my research is at right now. Hey, Jessica, I don't want to interrupt, but um, we are having trouble seeing you move forward on your slides. I think you're on slide five or six, but it's still showing one on the screen. Really? Mm -hmm. mm. Let me reshare because I'm still on about me. Yes, that's the one you just finished, right? Or this is where you're at in your, yeah. It's still where I'm at, but it's moving forward without me then? No, it was actually stuck. So we're seeing a new slide now. So looks good. So. We're, we're on the same page then, the about mm -hmm. me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you. Let me know. I'm almost done. So let me know if it successfully moves forward with me. <laughs> thank you so much, y'all. Um, and then I just want to kind of wrap up. I think it's really important that I own that um, I am both the colonizer and the colonized. Um, this was something that I had read in a book. I can't even remember which book it was that I was doing for dissertation purposes. Um, and I read this and I immediately grew goosebumps on, you know, my throughout my entire body, essentially. Um, being a biracial woman, um, even with my Mexican ancestry, knowing that the colonization that exists there, being that I very much turned to be a white passing Latina during the fall when I lose my brown skin tone, um, I think it's important that I own this and that I keep in mind the privilege that I hold and making sure that when I'm sitting at certain tables, I'm pulling up extra chairs with me. Um, also, when I need to take a seat and be quiet and just listen. Um, and so I always... I'm very passionate about making sure that I'm owning this because it's important that I'm it's essentially challenging and pushing my own community to do the same, right? And folks that possibly share the same identities as me. Crystal, did it stay and just go to change maker? Awesome. And then sexologist, sex educator, and advocate, most definitely. Um, rewriting harmful intergenerational scripts is another jam of mine. I love working again with the young adult population, but also um, male identifying folks who are battling with what is toxic masculinity and healthy masculinity and getting to rewrite those scripts for them. And then lastly, um, a pleasure advocate, y'all. So exactly why I'm here today. Um, I love essentially closing the orgasm gap. I love empowering young women, specifically women of color, um, to be able to learn their bodies, know what their bodies are capable of, um, and essentially really serving specifically the students that I work with, right, for our victims and survivors of sexual assault, getting them back to a point where they feel comfortable in the body um, that they are in, right? And so pleasure advocacy is a huge, huge, huge um, passion of mine and making sure that I'm out in the community and also educating about it as well. So happy to be here today. All right, I'm gonna to attempt to move on to the next slide, learning objectives. 
Crystal, we good? Okay. Um, so participants, hopefully today y'all are going to gain a better understanding of what is a sex positive framework, um, to, the integration of sex positivity to even your own work, and then sex positive tools. Hopefully you'll be able to take a few away um, and that it will feel comfortable for you in the way that you're navigating the work that you do. I'm going to move you down just a little bit. Okay. So we're going to start first. Sexual assault and colonization. Um, if y'all are not familiar with Roxanne Gay's Not That Bad, um, this book is really, really good. I don't I've, drop in the chats if you have read this book. Very inspiring. Essentially, it's a quick read, short stories, people's experiences with rape culture. With that, one of the stories in here um, essentially is about a person speaking to the um, reality of their sexual assault and how it was the colonization of their body and the way that they experienced that. My colleague came to me and said, Jessica, this is exactly what you're constantly always talking about in the office. You need to read about it. So with that, y'all, I want to start today with our bodies, our, our land. We hear, you know, missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, this is definitely something that they are constantly saying. It's on their website. It's on their, you know, on, on all of their merchandise, our bodies, our land. With that, the land I lived in was stolen from me. I want to go home, but it's not the same. Therefore, I am forced to learn a new land. Y'all, when we think of our victims and survivors of sexual assault, we think of their bodies. Is the land right that they lived in? It was stolen from them when the sexual assault occurred. We know that there's a desire to go back to the old land, but it's just simply not the same. And therefore, our survivors are forced to relearn something new, right? They have to relearn the land that which they now occupy. With that, I want us to think whether we're clinicians here, we're advocates, we're educators, or we encompass all of those identities. I have here clearly the purple is the land I lived in, was stolen from me, and then it's halfway marked, I want to go home. The purple highlights the therapeutic interventions and possibly the advocacy and education and prevention work that we're doing. I know that for me, I can very much relate to this with the advocacy and education work that I'm doing on my campus, right? I very much am talking to students about the preventative measures of what it means to make sure we understand consent, coercion, sexual assault, et cetera, right? I know that I'm talking to them about how consent and alcohol does not mix. I know that I'm talking to students um, who are seeking my support and advocacy because they have experienced sexual assault. They know that their body essentially was stolen from them in that moment, and they have a desire to go home. Me getting them connected to a clinician on campus or within the community is that attempt to get them to go home, but they know that it's not the same. Where I am struggling, y'all, and what makes me passionate about this work, because technically I'm not licensed yet, and with the Texas State uh, Social Work Board's recent happenings, um, I'm not very excited to be licensed anytime soon. Hopefully we'll have some very quick change in policy with that. Um, but with that, what I'm experiencing with my students who are survivors is that we come, we do great, they're doing great work with their clinicians, but there becomes a stop. And the stop is, is that we're not moving forward with how are they relearning the body that they now occupy? How are they relearning the land that they now occupy, right? And so then me as an already sex positive framework, um, education, you know, background, I'm asking those questions that essentially probably aren't being asked. And I know they aren't being asked within the clinical realm. And when I talk to other advocates, I can sometimes sense the same, oh yeah, I'm not asking those questions either. I, I don't necessarily have that training or that background and that's okay. I mean, that's the whole reason why we're here today, right? So essentially what's labeled in green is, but it's not the same and therefore I'm forced to learn a new land is where we can implement a sex positive framework. Ideally, by the end of this presentation, I'm gonna show you the slide again and the whole thing's gonna be green. Because if we take what we've learned today and we implement it, we'll be able to ser serve survivors in an entirety of sex positive framework that allows them the moment they walk into our office, letting us know that the land they lived in is no longer the same, all the way to relearning that new land, we can implement in a sex positive way, all right? Moving forward with the critical reminder. 
So sex is a basic human function, y'all, that affects psychological health, relationship satisfaction, and overall well-being. I want you to remember this. I want you to take a picture. I can definitely provide my entire PowerPoint to Crystal if we can get it sent out. But we have to remember that sex is a basic function of literally our psychological health and our overall well-being. We cannot ignore it. And too many times, whether we're in the education or advocacy or clinical setting, we're ignoring the impact, right, of the sexual assault and then the aftermath with the new body at which they live in. I'm going to move forward quickly with the case study just to familiarize us and put us all on the same page of what we already know. Jessica survived a sexual assault by an East Asian man in his mid-20s who drove her to a forest in his blue pickup truck and raped her. What we know from Jessica moving forward with a sexual assault occurring is that Jessica has these potential triggers, right? Possibly the potential triggers may be men, men in their 20s, blue vehicles, places with lots of trees, certain smells, etc. What we have to remember is that Jessica still, right, needs to be treated for her entire body, right? Because sex is going to impact her overall well-being no matter what. So with that, the gold standard that we usually see with our clinical processing of any type of trauma is the prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy, EMDR, and some of you might even have other things that you would add to this list that have proven very successful with treating trauma and the PTSD associated triggers that come with that. Um, I would say that they confidently have, you know, share similar goals with teaching that, you know, triggers such as fear, panic, or dread are going to eventually pass if there is commitment from the client, right? Preparation for the future. And how are we going to implement healthy coping mechanisms to get us through that? With addressing trauma on the educational and advocacy side, we might be implementing a little bit of that clinical, but not in the micro level, right? Because like myself, I'm not licensed. Other advocates may not be licensed. Some advocates may be licensed and they're getting to implement that fully. Micro and macro work is definitely taking place. A lot of that educational piece is happening. So in my room, I'm education, educating both at the micro level and then at this, the macro, the system level as well, right? So the prevention, the harm reduction, the bystander intervention, and then the most important piece is actually giving students language to what it means to understand coercion, sexual assault, harassment, relationship violence, et cetera. I don't know about y'all, but I know that I'm sure some of you can relate that after, especially with advocacy works who are active with the educational outreach and community work, after you get done presenting, um, it never fails me to have one or two people walk up and say, thank you for finally giving me um, the language to use or the word to describe what I have experienced. That's a, that's a common experience that I have, especially working in higher education, right? We have the community interventions and partnerships. We have BIT programs passive campaignings, maximizing on volunteers and interns, and much more. But again, Jessica is still a sexual being, right? So we have to include that sexual contact may, for Jessica, be comprised of touching, kissing, role play, lubrication, BDSM kink, orgasm, flirting and initiations of sexual behaviors, you know, and then we can identify oral, genital, nipple stimulation, intercourse, anal possibly. I want to insert the critical reminder again that sex is a basic human function that affects psychological health, relationship satisfaction, and overall well-being. Because again, Jessica has presented, she has disclosed what has happened. Immediately, we will go ahead and treat, right, or educate, depending on what realm we're supporting her in. But I feel at some point, there's going to come a stop, and that's where we get to implement the sex positive framework today. So moving forward, what is sex positive framework? What does it come from? Well, actually y'all, it actually, it comes from a, a multiple magnitude of fields. And I say that because feminist studies are talking about it. Counseling psychology is talking about it. Social work, adolescent sexuality, um, school systems, queer theory, criminology, law, um, sex positive theory and multicultural education and a couple more, all right? So it's not that it's not being talked about, it's just more being integrated on a higher level, especially with women pushing back on their own sexual and human rights. What does it mean to be sex positive then? 
Kim's and et al, sex positivity has been defined as the belief that all consensual expressions of sexuality are valid and further argues the need to focus on the client's personal meaning of their sexuality and its relationship with their well-being. When I see this definition, I automatically love it because of the consensual piece, and I'm sure some of you would agree with me. Also, the focus on the client's personal meaning of their sexuality and how it impacts their overall well-being. Amazing. When we look at the sex-positive feminist perspectives and how they define it, similar definition with the emphasis on the positive notions of desire, pleasure, the reaffirmation of consent, so the affirmative consent, meaning yes means yes, and then the concern for well-being for self and others. So we see some the similarities here because we know in the world of academia and when we're doing one research or any research, one scholar says this, other scholar says that. What I appreciate about the definitions, the working definitions that we have here are both are highlighting and honoring the consensual piece, right? With the, with the definitely the affirmation. They're both talking um, sex as the well-being of the client and the affirmation of identity and how the client is identifying sex. And then when we're looking at the feminist perspective, we're absolutely emphasizing the desire and pleasure piece. Moving forward, this is how sex positivity has been labeled by a different couple organizations and folks within the industry. Sexuality is not just something that we do. It is part of who we are. So reaffirming the well-being, right? So when we think of Jessica's situation, I want you to keep bringing it full circle back her entire well-being, okay? It can be more useful to reframe our definition of sex positivity from sex as a positive thing to working towards a more positive relationship with sex. So empowering, Glickman from 2000. Um, oh, uh, I don't know if it's owner of Good Vibrations, which is a sex positive um, toy store, very affirming. Um, and so what I appreciate most about this definition and the way that Glickman describes sex positivity is the intersectionality piece. Working towards a more positive relationship with sex, y'all, allows us to focus on the consent, safety, harm reduction, the education piece, the sensitivity to age, race, ability, sexual orientation, culture, and pleasure. And then lastly, they describe Easton and Terramino and Thorne, more liberal view towards sexual agency with consent at the front forefront and that people should do what feels good to them. An important takeaway with sex positivity after hearing that is a lot of folks will feel like, oh, sex positivity, it's just too extreme. Um, you know, it's the, it's the liberal, the liberal view. It's really not that, right? It's, it's literally honoring um, what a person and how they describe their sexual experiences and what their sexual needs are. Um, the exploration of one's body, emphasizing consent and safety. Um, one, one thing that I really appreciate about this framework is how they define sex. So Wooda and Panful say, sex is described and any associated pleasure or well-being to consensual acts. Again, y'all, that consent piece continues to come full circle through the entire framework of sex positivity. Rape, sexual coercion, and other forms of sexual assault are not recognized as sex, but rather as acts of violence, power, and control. When I read this and I learned about implementing a sex positive framework, especially when working with victims and survivors, I was like, this is it. This is exactly what I feel like I have been talking about with my clients, what I've been educating students on, and why I'm so passionate about spreading the word of what it means to be sex positive and implementing it into the work that we do. What is the actual framework then? Well, Williams and colleagues tell us, positive refers to strengths, well-being and happiness. Surprise y'all that well-being pops back up. So again, the emphasis on how sex and sexuality is literally a part of our overall well-being as a human. We cannot ignore it. We know that in our realm, when victims come forward, the shame that exists, right? The reaffirmation that we provide to our clients saying, you are so dang courageous for making it to my office or for asking for support, right? Because we know that shame, if more than likely, has already been eating them up and they have been suffering in silence. Shame literally thrives in silence and in secrecy, right? So the reaffirmation of why we need to be implementing this sex-positive framework. 
individual sexuality is unique and multifaceted. Absolutely. And that is even the intersectionality piece that was mentioned previously. Positive sexuality embraces multiple ways of knowing. Positive sexuality reflects professional ethics. Positive sexuality promotes open, honest communication. Positive sexuality is humanizing. It encourages peacemaking and it is applicable, applicable across all levels of social structure. Now, I've raved a lot about the sex positive framework and how amazing this is. It is great, but no framework, no theory, no community, nothing is perfect, right? And we know that. And I want to recognize that right now because I wasn't going to come on this call and act like this was the one all be all. The framework's weaknesses, y'all, was that we know Black and brown women have been doing the work of sex positivity since day one, okay? It was in 20, um, literally 15, 16, when again, this kind of this term re kind of, um, you know, reignited back into the world. Um, of which we all thrive in, in the, in the sex therapy world, the human sexuality world, and what it meant to be sex positive. Well, this was very much fueled by predominantly white women when, when really black and brown women had been doing this work for decades. Um, and so it's important that we, that we recognize that today. Bell Hooks startled an audience during an interview by suggesting that the face of sexual liberation for black women might be celibacy. Understanding that when we think about, um, you know, when, when we think about what it means to reframe the label as slut, right? When we try to reframe that term, knowing that, that that's a very derogatory term used towards marginalized populations to describe their sexuality, right? We have to be um, even more intentional about creating affirming and courageous spaces for our clients who identify as Black Indigenous women of color, knowing the harm that has been done towards their bodies when we look at reproductive rights, right? When we look at the distrust even between medicine and mental health and seeking help and support, you know, with, with marginalized communities. So that is the framework weaknesses, but it's also a positive reframe knowing that if you are someone that's truly interested in, in implementing this into the work that you do, you have an opportunity to create a courageous and brave space. In my personal opinion, space, safe spaces do not exist, right? We know this even in the work that we do with victims and survivors. When you ask them, um, you know, wh where did the assault happen? Half of the time it's in the place, more than, more than half of the time it's in the place that they described the safest, right? And so also what's safe for me is not safe for you or the next person, right? We're all going to contract for safety differently based on our personal experiences as a human being. So therefore with this positive reframe is if I have a black indigenous woman of color, man of color, person of color sitting across from me, I can create a courageous and brave space for that person to be open about their experience and what it is to be a sexual you know, being for them um, without implementing right harm, as long as we know that we're aware and we're making sure um, that we're implementing it correctly, right? All right, so moving forward, how are we actually going to integrate this into the work that we do? Well, y'all, it honestly, it starts exactly with you. Um, I, all the time, am constantly educating my students on self-pleasure, learning their body, on learning how their body operates, learning what feels good to them, what doesn't feel good to them. How are we communicating our pleasures, um, our wants, our sexual wants and needs to our partners, right? So it's the same thing that I'm going to tell you is if, if we want to be sex positive, and we want to have a sex positive framework, and we want to treat our client, treat our students, our, you know, um, our you know, clients and students in their entirety, right? In this holistic model, it has to start with yourself. And what I mean by that is crews and colleagues give us five recommendations. The first recommendation that they highlight is exploring personal attitudes and beliefs about sexuality. You all, my program as an MSW and MED student in the sex therapy clinical track at Widener, I was very much forced to explore my personal attitudes and beliefs about my own sexuality and sexuality as a whole. I provide you questions here that you can ask yourself and I, I please, I encourage you to take a screenshot right now or pull out your cell phone and take this because this is something that sits with you well 
today or you continue to think about it in the next week, I highly encourage you to look at these questions and start to do your own journaling, start to incorporate them in the supervision that you are doing, start to incorporate them in the conversations that you are having with people who you trust, start to incorporate them in the conversations with your colleagues that you find appropriate. This is the way you're going to be able to explore your personal attitudes and beliefs, right? We cannot be sex positive until we're self-aware of, the, of, the, of our values, beliefs, and attitudes that we hold towards sex and sexuality, right? Um, it can be highly problematic for any of us to you know, um, treat clients um, due to a sexual assault, but trying to implement a sex positive framework if we haven't done the work ourselves, all right? We're only going to produce more harm for a client if we haven't dug, dug deep within our own lives and figured out where do my attitudes and my beliefs and my views align with sexuality, okay? Recommendation number two, developing sex positive knowledge and comfort about sexuality. With this y'all, the human sexuality course you took in undergrad or possibly your graduate program is not enough. If I have folks on this call who went to the Kinsey Institute, who went to the San Francisco Sexuality um, Institute, or who went to Widener University, or possibly has a sex certification already, or sex, cert sex therapy certification, um, I think George Washington University in St. Louis, Michigan State has a sex certification. I know there's a couple institutions in Florida. Unless you've attended any of those, right? Um, more than likely, we maybe had the one undergraduate course where everyone loved to sign up because it was your one opportunity to actually talk about sex um, because K through 12 sex education in America tends to be really, really, really crappy and continues to fail our, our children. It continues to fail us when we get to be grown adults um, or young adults, like I'm talking about with young women that I work with on campus and they're not even aware that they have three holes down there and it's a complete mind blown conversation. Um, and so, Yes, this is, this is exactly where the developing a sex positive knowledge and comfort about sexuality requires you to, to push into the continuing education credits, right? It um, wants you to become more familiar with treatments that support sexual dysfunction, such as disorder of desire, arousal, and orgasm. Take the se sexual ethics of therapy. Get involved with ASECT. Um, go and challenge yourself, right, um, to preventing harm to clients by being intentional about our continuing education, supervision, and conference selections that are sexuality specific. We have to lean into it in order to know more. We have to want to be proactive about conducting the research necessary in order for us to truly embrace what it means to be sex positive. We have to be intentional about, oh my gosh, I've never been to a sexuality conference. Let me go ahead and reach out to Jessica or let me do a quick Google search and see what's in the area, right? Or what's, you know, ASEC is a national conference. Sex Down South is a national conference. Um, I'm missing a lot um, of conferences right now. But those are just to name a few, right? That, that you can start to gain interest in and start attending and expanding your own sexual lens and what it means to be able to serve um, your clients. Recommendation number three, integrating social justice into sex positive practice. So y'all, we have to check our biases and assumptions about client sexuality. We know that we are not perfect human beings, but until we really are uh, passionate about checking our own biases and assumptions, um, we're gonna continue to do harm, right? To possibly our clients if we don't have those already in check. Um, with all diversity and social justice work, the complexity of human beings is vast. And there's possibility for assumptions and prejudice to pervade in the work that we do. Um, given that sexuality is one universal aspect of human experience, it is understandably interwoven with most other aspects of identity. It is thus to be expected that sex negativity is linked not only to biases associated with various sexual practices, but also to sexism, racism, homophobia, and ageism. You all, a lot of us, we simply going back to we don't know what we don't know. A lot of folks will stigmatize sexuality such as kink, BDSM, um, polyamory because they are uneducated and they don't know. Uh, same thing towards our biases um, against sexual minorities. Again, folks being uneducated, not pushing themselves to lean into the discomfort and expand their educational lens. We also have to be very, very cognizant again of what 
marginalized, uh, minoritized communities, specifically black and brown women, um, what they have been through history-wise um, with the regulation of their sexuality and their bodies and the distrust that can exist between our systems that we operate and, and their communities. The next one is engage in the critical self-reflection piece. So I think this makes sense with maximizing the most on our supervision. Again, a trusted you know, supervisor, professional colleague, someone that can truly help you um, and challenge you, right? Where did, that, where did that script come from? Who told you that gay folks um, you know, complete the sentence? Who told you that? Who, who embedded that in your mind? And why have you continued to not challenge and push back and want to rewrite that script? Why have you been complacent with allowing that to occupy your thoughts rather than actually going and doing your personal research and then possibly, possibly in a, in, in a safest way as possible, you know, reaching out and, and learning about someone else's experience, right? And then our next one here is number four, proactively raising sex and sexuality as a topic. So what I mean by this is include sexuality topics in your online professional profiles and marketing materials. Y'all, we love, when I, when I was searching for my therapist here in Dallas, Texas, I saw like everyone just putting all of these specializations, right? But nothing was anything positive, sex positive affirming. Um, so if this, is, if this feels good to you and it's something that you continue to explore, add that sex positive terminology. Let them know that you want to talk about sexual functioning, that you want to talk about sexual desire and pleasure. Add those on there so folks know, hey, this is a person that clearly has done their research and has some sort of passion here that wants to help folks that are presenting with these, with these issues, with these common traits. Integrate sexuality into your paperwork and initial assessment procedures. Y'all, this is so easy. I'm saying move past just pronouns. If you're already doing pronouns, I love it. Thank you. International Pronouns Day was yesterday. I hope that you celebrated. Um, but I want you to take that a step further in the intake paperwork. I want you to say, tell me about your, your sexual life and satisfaction. Let, let your, you know, your client fill that out and however sees fit to them or provide them with some type of inventory that they're allowed to say, you know, if, if you say, um, you know, common problems with, with sex or sexuality and give them a couple spaces that they can check off, you know, with associations. But being able to say, tell me about your sexual um, health and satisfaction and what does that look like right now for you, right, is already opening those gates to you being a sex positive clinician, advocate, educational, um, you know, wh whatever your job title is. Um, and initial assessment procedures, I apologize about that. Invite discussion and be mindful of the process when talking about sex and sexuality. So this definitely correlates with the last one about being intentional with language and increase comfort with sexual words. If we were all in a room together, one of my favorite activities to do is to give, you know, when we were pre-COVID and we could literally touch things all together and not have to worry about sanitizing every five seconds. Um, I would give y'all a bunch of Play-Doh and we would make vulvas. And this is usually an opportunity when I see a lot of giggling going on, more I would describe it as childlike interactions, talking about, oh my gosh, look at your clitoris, or, you know, I see your, you know, labia minoris there, majoris, oh my gosh, you're doing so good, are we going to put hair, are we not? And it's an activity that literally allows people to start naming their parts, but also normalizing the language. What I encourage, encourage and challenge folks to do is I need you to take that language outside of this room. I created this brave and courageous space right now for us to do this activity together and, and be able to reflect and process. I need you to do the same thing when you're in the educational realm, when, you're, when you have your advocacy hat on, when you're doing your therapeutic interventions with your clients. Y'all, language is so important. If we can't say vulva, penis, um, breast, anus, buttocks, um, nipples without, you know, laughter or there's some discomfort there, we're not there yet. We're not there to go ahead and serve a survivor and in a holistic model, right? We, we're going to stay at that. Um, I'm going to be able to address that your land was stolen from you um, and that you want to go home, but I'm not going to be able to get you past on what it means to relearn and reappreciate the new land that you have right now, right? 
Um, another big thing here that I want to talk about with language, because I know our world thrives off of consent and educating folks about consent, the way that we empower our clients when we're working with them, especially survivors, is asking for their consent when we're having any type of conversation. But more importantly, y'all, when we bring in the topic of sex and sexuality. So one of my examples here is, may I ask you a question pertaining to your sexual health? Like so empowering to be able to say, may I ask you a question about your sexual health? And your client gets to determine or your student gets to determine right then and there whether they want to engage in that conversation today or not. And if they don't, perfectly fine. You'll go ahead and revisit it in two, four weeks, whatever, whatever the treatment plan is, right? Um, but being a, being, giving them the authority to let you know, you know what, yes, we're going to engage in this conversation today because I'm ready to talk about it. But you also opening up that door on gently nudging and saying, hey, we're going to talk about sexual health when you're ready. Because again, this is part of your overall well-being. All right, our last one, being mindful of how you approach sexuality. So building rapport and trust with clients before discussing sexuality. Absolutely, y'all. Um, if we were all in a room, we would be like common sense. We're, if, if, if we're serving a survivor, I'm not talking to them about sex and sexuality on the first time, right? Um, we're not talking about sex and sexuality for actually a couple visits. Um, I'm still meeting with students all the way from literally fall 2019, right? And we're still doing some great work together, mostly because I'm asking them now the questions about their body that's not being asked in the clinical setting. Um, but I'm, I didn't ask that on day one. I built the trust, I built the rapport, right? And then I went and asked. Um, I'm gonna highlight here in a couple more slides, one sexual health question that I do ask very quickly. It's usually within the top three, top five range of questions that I'm asking, but that will make sense to you. Knowing when to consult versus referring out. Um, I think this is you know, something that we could all definitely chime in on. I think we're all very passionate about what it means you know, to be um, advocates, to be clinicians, and what it means to refer out and consult. Um, I think when we uh, folks allow themselves to sometimes become grow intimidated with, with, with what it means to implement a sex positive framework and a sense of if they haven't evaluated where their values and beliefs and all of that great stuff aligns, they let the, the notions creep in of what if my client becomes attracted to me? What if I become attracted to my client? Um, and rarely, y'all, in the field of, of human sexuality, folks have done, you know, the, the internal work necessary to make sure that if they have those feelings going on, that they're seeking supervision or that's a confident referral out, right? But I also want to talk about that when we do refer out, I want us to keep in mind, especially when we're thinking about a survivor, okay? If you're a clinician, again, or an advocate where you're just staying kind of at the land was stolen, it was invaded, I want to go home, but it doesn't feel, if you're staying right in those first three lines, okay? And then all of a sudden, Jessica, our case study today, tells you, hey, I'm experiencing pain when I'm attempting to have sex with my partner. And then all of a sudden, your next response is, well, I'm going to go ahead and have to refer you out because now you need um, uh, someone that specializes in, you know, uh, sexual pain. And I want to honor that if that is where you're at. I also want to challenge you to, um, to think about what type of um, feeling possibly your client now has, right? Especially when we think of the shame that, that encompasses uh, victims and survivors so much. You've done such great work together. And then for a client to you know, open up and be vulnerable in that moment, um, to an advocate, to a clinician, and only to get referred out could very much go back into that shameful mindset of, oh, I knew this is what was gonna happen, right? Um, we have to be cognizant that common referrals to sex therapists or other therapists with expertise when clients require more specific treatment um, can definitely give off, you know, the stigmatization, this, the stigmatization that, um, you know, that, they're, that the sexual concerns that they have, you know, now need to be treated by a specialist because it's essentially too much they're too difficult to handle. And so I just wanna challenge that with what that means, right? When we're referring out versus when we as a clinician can take a step back and say, you know what, let me do a little bit more research right now. Um, let me see what I can do, how much I can learn and what we can do to get through this together, right? 
So the application of sex positive tools. So this is how I am essentially um, implementing sex positive framework into the work that I do. I said that there's a question that I asked pretty quickly early on in the setting on when I'm meeting with students right away and they disclose that they've experienced sexual assault. STI and HIV, y'all, if we are talking and we have built that trust and rapport to where they have given me the details that they feel appropriate is there. And I have not heard them yet identify whether safety was, uh, sexual safety was used, right? So let's say in this case, it's a heterosexual couple um, and they have not identified yet that a condom was used. I will absolutely ask that question, okay? Because it is important that I'm taking care of my students' sexual health and that I am educating them on the importance of making sure that they are taking care of their sexual health as well. I am lucky and I am fortunate that I work on a campus where I can, you know, I can get the paperwork in place that allows me to literally walk my student to health services. If they want me in the room with them, we can do a whole nother layer of paperwork and I can be there present with them while they go through these tests. But it is so important that in a sex positive framework that we are asking about was, was any type of safety, was any type of condoms used, um, you know, to, 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 to have the conversation about sexual health, especially if they did not go necessarily to an emergency room, right, or had a SANE exam after that would have asked them these type of questions to get them the medication that they need. Um, so this is something that I do ask pretty quickly. Um, luckily, it usually ends up being a very a pivotal time within the within my conversations with, with my students because then they see, all right, you truly are concerned about making sure that everything is checked off my list and that you're advocating for me on all regards, sexual health included. Normalizing sex, expanding students' definitions of sex and emphasizing self-pleasure is absolutely sex positive tools that I am adapting um, into the, the coursework that I develop into my workshops. Reframing virginity, um, with the sexual journey. Virginity, y'all, is a social construct. So when I hear students use this terminology, um, I go ahead and one, I ask them, where did that come from, right? So I try to get them into that, into that awareness of who told me that script. And then I say, wow, sexual journey just feels a lot more empowering because, um, you know, I chose to do this with someone else who chose to do that with me. This wasn't a one-way street. It was two people, right? Or three, four, five, whatever a person's situation is, but reframing that for them, that virginity, mm, not so much. Let's go with the sexual journey piece because that's way more empowering. And actually you told me that, you know, you wanted to do that and, and the other person, it sounded like, you know, consensual. So yeah, sounds like y'all started that sexual journey together and, and, and congratulations, whatever the conversation is, right? Language, so again, normalizing and integrating the importance of being able to address body parts. Um, asking my students, what do you call your vulva, right? Letting them tell me, hey, this is how I identify my body. This is how I identify, this is how I, you know, I use uh, these words to affiliate with sex or, um, you know, this type of sexual experience is called this. So letting your client and your students educate you, right? Uh, Vanderkolk tells us, and the body keeps us for We can read all the textbooks that we want and conduct all the research that we want. The expert, however, is always sitting right across from us. The expert of the story is sitting right across from us. So um, I always try to ask them and, and let them educate me on what feels appropriate in this conversation and then honor that moving forward. Um, obviously, body image, very, very sex positive. Um, using pictures, y'all, truly impactful. I'm going to show you a couple images that I use just for specifically when I'm working with women um, and educating them on their vulva. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that and how impactful that's been lately. Um, sex positive workshops with that language piece. I'll show you the way I word those. Celebrating orgasms, ask the questions that aren't being asked. How is sex for you? When you say it's painful, tell me more about where you are experiencing pain. How was your sexual experience with your partner or solo, et cetera. Again, y'all, the reason why I have the relationships that I do with my students and the reason why they are seeing clinicians but coming back and still wanting to maintain the relationship is because I'm asking them the questions about the overall well-being of their body. And that's where we have to shift when we're serving our victims and survivors of sexual assault. Sensate focused therapy is one of my favorites. Um, empowering my colleagues and student staff to promote sex positivity. Actually, the STI HIV testing I was going through that experience um, with my colleague and I was saying, hey, you just told me that you met with this student, student disclosed sexual assault. 
Um, where are we at with H STI and making sure they're getting, you know, the, the STI exam, HIV, whatever feels appropriate to them set up with health services. And she kind of looked at me and I was like, are we not doing that? And she's like, oh, no. And I was like, that's okay. Moving forward, let's, let's make sure that we implement that into the work we do because that's a part of the sexual health piece, right? Let's go ahead and get them the medication that they need, the precautions, et cetera, um, because that way we're not having to pick up other pieces later on. We can be proactive about that right now. And we can also emphasize to that student that we care about their sexual health. And then always supplying resources. Um, helpful images. These are some beautiful images that I use. Um, I think it's duvet days, if I'm saying it right. Could be saying it completely wrong. So they give awesome images of the vulva in a way that is very beautiful to look at. Um, again, identifying all the main areas. Y'all, I'm showing you these images because I just did a presentation last week in which a girl then reached out to me after or a young woman, not a girl, a young woman, um, college age again. And she said, Ms. Jessica, thank you so much for actually putting those images up there of a vulva, because now I know for the first time in my life that I'm different. And I said, what, what, what do you mean? What's going on? And so she went through this whole entire spiel about how she has had the most horrible experience with attempting to have sex. Any type of sexual penetration literally makes her cry. Y'all, she has an imperforated hymen. She did not realize that she had an imperforated hymen. She did, she knew something was wrong, but until she saw the images, that was the affirmation that her hymen was not all the way open, all right? And so now I am so adamant based on that one experience. There's a lot more of experiences that I've had with great positive feedback with these pictures, but the simple fact that these images were able to put together for a young woman the way her body was operating. And now I'm actually working with her to find her, um, you know, a, an appropriate gyno slash surgeon in the Dallas DFW area that can essentially, um, you know, get her lined up with surgery and get her through the healing process to maximize over winter break. So again, that educational piece can be crucial um, for, for our clients, giving them the language that they need um, about their bodies. Because again, we all did not receive this possibly in K through 12, or if we did, it was very abstinence only, risk induced, right? The scare tactics. And I know right now that they're not, um, it, it, maybe education hasn't changed that much, especially with the current administration. We've taken a lot of steps back from when we were very much um, on, under Obama's term where we were kind of shifting that lens to more of the, the consent piece, right? And the more of let's educate students on what sex is and the pleasure piece instead of doing um, the, the scare tactics and the, and the abstinence only. Um, I always in, you know, in, encourage anyone to make sure that they're understanding their body, using fun things that relate to the audience that I am talking with. And then my on-campus and community workshops, y'all, this is my sex positive language that I'm talking about. Um, La Chingona, three-part series on female empowerment that discusses mental health, sexuality, and bodily autonomy. You all do not be afraid to call it what it is and what you are talking about with folks. Um, I called it exactly what it is today, and I'm excited to have you all on this call. So there's something with a sex-positive language that gets folks to the room, right? And then as my, I'm a part of a Latina sorority, and so I'm very passionate about making sure that I'm educating my own community so I'm a lot more um, intentional with vulva health, tabu no mas, let's talk about sex. Healthy relationships plus consent equals better sex. I want to end you with last thoughts. Sex positivity starts with you, number one, right? You have to be the one that wants to implement the framework. You have to be the one that wants to dig deep and figure out where did all of these beliefs come from? Who put this into my into you know, my head? What scripts do I want to rewrite? What scripts feel really good to continue to pass on? to other folks, uh, past, you know, your own children, uh, family members, et cetera. Normalizing pleasure and consent is literally the framework. Consent is at the forefront of the therapeutic relationship or the advocate relationship. Create brave and courageous sex positive spaces. Um, assist with developing he healthy sexual values. You all can do this once you've focused on you, once you've focused on your healthy sexual values, you wanna relabel those, that way you can be aware when you're doing that work with others. 
develop clients' sexual subjectivity, educate um, on how one benefits from sexuality, empower your client to regain their personal agency and bodily autonomy, and be who you needed when you were younger. Think back when you were a young adolescent or whenever you started your sexual journey or whatever your story is, y'all, in a sense of who did you need as the sex role model, who was there and who wasn't there. Now dig deep and go through the five recommendations and be who you needed when you were younger. I still say that and I still get my goosebumps every time. We all have our own stories, but I think that hits home the most because if we were all in a room together, we would all have some type of common shared, um, probably not so great K through 12 sex education, family scripts, community scripts, peer scripts, et cetera, that we can relate to and what it means the importance of being who we needed when we were younger. Lastly, when you implement the framework, all of this turns green. We get to treat Jessica in her entirety, right? We get to talk to her about the land that she lived in, how it was stolen from her, how she wants to go home, but it's not the same, but how, guess what? We get to relearn your body and I get to be here along with you and, and, your, and your survivorship and how you're relearning your body. Um, and I get to give you help, healthy coping you know, tools to move forward. And I get to give you the education and the resources and the language to feel empowered. But this all turns green, y'all, when we become, um, when we implement our sex positive framework. Here is my contact information and I can always drop it in the chat too, but I would love to connect. So jessica.sanchez at uta.edu. And then of course my resources and I will stop now. That's the end of mine. And if there's any questions that we have. All right, we have a few in the Q&A box here and y'all keep dropping in questions as we go through these. Um, can you please list some of the sex positive conferences that you know of? <clears throat> I apologize, mute. Also, I just have to give a shout out. I think it's Lauren, current dual degree student at Widener. Yay, congratulations. That was me, I'm so excited. Please reach out to me. Um, yes, so let's see, Sister Song is an amazing one. Sex Down South, um, American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Secus is another one. Um, I'm trying to think of, I'm so sorry, I should have had all these listed. Those are definitely my, my top four that are coming up to, coming up right now at the top of my head. And then while we're, um, chatting through and going through the discussions, do you mind putting your contact info back up? Um, and then the slide with yeah. the, the events for your Instagram, so. Let's see. Which slide did we want? Um, I know you had some upcoming events um, that you shared from your social media. Um, that's just, so that's just the way I advertise. I was using that to show folks how I implement a sex positive framework with the wording. And then um, about this, the contact info, so. contact info. Yeah. There you go. And yes, I agree. Somebody posted the images used, the anatomy images are so beautiful. So yes, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, that was, um, that was such an inspirational, oops, I sent that to Crystal. I meant to send it to everyone, my email address. Um, those images are, have been like a staple in, in all of my presentations when working with the young adult women on campus. Um, I cannot tell you how many times people coming up to me after and just saying thank you for literally talking about my vulva and putting names to, um, you know, the, all of the parts that are on the vulva and what it means to have a clitoris and what the clitoris is capable of. Um, but my last, that, that student last week with the imperforated hymen, whew, that was like, your moment when, you know, it's been a rough month and you have that one client student reach out and just reaffirm for you the work that you're doing mm -hmm. and why it's important to embody this sex positive framework because it made me think of a lot of other things when we think of um, sexual assault and the body 
Um, but knowing that now I can get her connected to the resources that she needs and a very sex positive clinician, y'all like, or sex positive um, doctor, like plastic surgeon, we're coming up right now with all of her questions that she wants to ask in regards to what are her needs if she decides to move forward with this surgery? What does the aftercare look like? Um, you know, potentially what does that mean for her vulva and what does that mean relearning um, everything that pleasure has to offer for her? So we are doing some great work together. Mm -hmm. I appreciate y'all's comments. Thank you, I see them. Yeah. You liked it. The shout outs. Um, and for those who missed at the beginning, um, this webinar is being recorded. We do put it up on Klaus's YouTube channel. So um, this webinar and anything else that you might have missed, they're on our channel. So go check those out. So um, can you share the website that you found those images at? Or Yeah, let me, um, hmm, because I'm wondering if they, I think I actually found them off of the Instagram, the Duvet Days. Let me look, because her their tag is on there. Oh yeah, Holly Bowles put up the website, so. Oh, thank you, Holly. Yes, I just found it, yep. Oh, they have such great, and you can literally order the prints and frame them and get them for your office. So when clients, students are walking in, you're already setting even that, that expect, you know, that the kind of the environment, the space that exists for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a question about, do you have any resources for people that identify as asexual? I have a client exploring this identity. Yeah, would you mind, if they wouldn't mind sending me um, an email directly, I only say that because actually my interns right now are literally putting an entire resource guide together for LGBTQ plus community, and I have no problem sending that directly to you. Um, so yes, I know that they, it's, it's on there, and we have been talking about that a lot in our world lately. We've had a lot of students coming forward feeling like um, asexuality is not a part of the community. And so we were like, whoa, time out. Um, do you feel that here at UC Arlington? Because if we feel, if you feel that here, we gotta, we gotta reevaluate quickly and figure out what's going on. And they were just saying, no, we feel like we're just missing from the community that we don't have um, essentially uh, the same presence as other identities. And so we are definitely looking at being more intentional about providing resources, providing events around that identity and just spreading more awareness. All right, then we have a question about future uh, presentations. Uh, those are listed on our website as well, or you can email me, cgarcia.tasa.org, and I can send you. We have one left for the month of October on human trafficking. That's next Tuesday. That's going to be a good one, too. So, Crystal, is that the one with... Uh... Is it with John Rodriguez? Is he the one that's doing that? No, no. John, um, he had to go do some court stuff. So we're hoping to have him back in um, November or December. So. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I just connected with him on campus. So I was like, oh, you. We're going to have all the UTA, <laughs> like everybody, come to toss the webinars. <laughs> so. Awesome. Hi. Does anybody else have any questions, comments, feedback? I think this is such an innovative topic um, for the field and, and it's really hard to transition to this topic because it's such a fear-based, you know, so many people fear for sure. going back down this road with clients. So it's yeah, great. absolutely. Yeah. But it, we're just, we're, we're just missing so much when it looks, when we're looking at care for clients. Um, and I, yeah, I've, I've said multiple times to leadership, I'm like, have we started considering hiring you know, sex therapists or folks that are moving forward on resume saying I have, you know, a sex therapy certification or these are the courses or all the trainings, you know, that have equipped me with this knowledge um, because we have to be able to serve the survivors in their entire um, body, you know, mental, emotional, physical realm. And I feel like we're missing a piece, a major piece.
Okay, so we have people asking for the copy of the LGBTQ plus resource guide as well. So we'll yep. get you those, yeah, I'll get you those emails as well. So. Awesome, perfect. Yeah, send them my way and I will send out um, a, a great read if y'all are into um, Pleasure Activism by Adrienne uh, Marie Brown is an awesome, awesome, awesome read. Another one that I literally just started reading again um, is Come As You Are. And then the fabulous uh, Crystal just was like, wait, did you have the workbook? And I said, what, there's a workbook? <laughs> um, so now I need to get the workbook. But mm -hmm. literally these are the type of reads that I'm referring to my students as well and what it means to be able to have them educate themselves even at their own speed, right? Like that's the beautiful thing about reading. Like you can read a couple pages and then if it gets to be too much, put it down and you know, you come back to it when you're ready or we're, we literally process stuff together. So great way to be able to educate your clients and let them move at their own speed with it as well. Let's see if we have any more. We have lots of people saying yes on the LGBT plus resource guide. So we can send that out to attendees. So. Okay, perfect. Um, I was just going to say. a few books. What are your favorite ones? Um, so. um, yep. So the come as you are is definitely a favorite if y'all, and then depending on when you came in, not that bad by Roxanne Gay. If y'all have not, this is literally short stories on people's experience with rape culture and they are so powerful. This is like a 10 minute read. You will get it done so quickly. Um, Sex for One by Betty Dodson is a great read to, um, again, educate folks on what it means to experience self-pleasure and understanding what your body is capable of um, if you are a vulva owner um, and what it you know means to essentially connect as a whole. Um, I've always told folks I want to be the brown Betty Dodson. If you aren't familiar with Betty Dodson, she was facilitating very progressive, um, you know, very sex positive workshops that involved um, people being nude and her matching her clients right where they were at and empowering folks to be in a room full of full together. And it was folks only as vulva owners. Um, and you see the, the one little image with the girl holding the mirror up, literally like those type of workshops were happening that Betty was facilitating. And so she's just a piece when it comes to um, kind of the queen of like, this is how we navigate sex positivity and this is how we talk about self-pleasure. Um, so that's a great read. Betty Dodson, Sex for One. Um, she Comes First is a great one that's written by a man, Dr. Ian. Dr. Ian, um, last name's K. Just put in She Comes First. Mm -hmm. Comes First is a great one. Um, can I send out another sheet? Can we send out two sheets? Yes. Yeah, you, yeah, send me everything that you want our, our attendees Perfect. to have and I will link it up and I will send it out and email to all of our attendees, so. Perfect, yeah. I just started reading, well, I actually finished it. It's a book on corgasm. So if you are a person um, that likes to really work out and that's your thing, you can literally dive into how your workouts, you can experience orgasm and bring that all together with certain moves, specifically pelvic hip thrust, um, squats. And so, yeah, Corgasm is a great one that I just finished reading. It just definitely gave me a new perspective on what it means to know my body and understand my body. So I will absolutely send that Crystal's way. Um, that way y'all can have both resources for sure. Absolutely. And since you mentioned um, the body keeps the score. I think I've read a good like follow up book for that. It's called um, How to Feel Good Naked, and I think yes, it just thank you. like so perfectly. Um, you know, part of this more identified, more problem, and and how trauma is stored in the body, and then you get a match up and a follow up of this is how you move forward in that process. Yes, so. yes I love that. Thank you for adding that on there. All right, everyone, I think we are going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, okay. The Body Keeps the Score is a great read. Yes, absolutely. So, yes, so, love so. it. Also, a good, a good follow-up, too, with that, um, How to Feel Good Naked, but also The Body Remembers. Mm -hmm. A great one to follow up with after um, The Body Keeps the Score. So, yeah. I appreciate y'all so much. Thank you for maybe stepping out of comfort zones and just attending something new. 
or supporting the cause. So please reach out to me if you're interested in connecting. Um, I'm here in, in Texas now, so travel and see y'all, whatever we need to do. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll stick around for a few seconds in case anything else comes up, but okay. y'all have a good rest of your day. Bye.